This episode of Brainwaves was brought to you by Audible, your source for audiobooks. Your first month and first book of Audible are free at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. My favorite book is The World According to Garp, and you can read it too, using your ears, on Audible. Just go to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves for a free 30-day trial. Welcome to another installment of the Brainwaves Podcast, your source for neurology audiocation. I'm Jim Sigler, and today, in case you might not have guessed it from the title of this show, we'll be talking about drug-induced Parkinsonism, which happens to be the second most common cause of Parkinsonism in the world, so it is pretty important. We have an upcoming show involving a patient with atypical Parkinson's disease in episode 68, and what we're going to cover here and now is meant to supplement that content. So, stay tuned for that upcoming show. Joining me for this episode of the Quanta series is Dr. Sneha Mantri, a fellow in movement disorders. And she's going to briefly describe some of the medications she typically thinks of when she encounters a patient with drug-induced PD. Yeah, so um, neuroleptic exposure is a big one, um, particularly in uh, patients with comorbid schizophrenia, more severe depression or bipolar disorder. And the typical neuroleptics were notorious for this. We don't often use those or see those used in practice as much anymore. But among the current atypical um, neuroleptics, the atypical antipsychotics, aripiprazole and risperidone um, seem to have a higher incidence of causing drug-induced Parkinsonism. It turns out this has to do with their affinity for the D2 receptor, which is greater for many of the first-generation neuroleptics like haloperidol, chlorpromazine, and flufinazine, among several others. Conversely, uh, quetiapine and clozapine are less likely to cause drug-induced Parkinsonism, but any medicines in that class can cause it. And this is probably because of the higher affinity of these second-generation or atypical neuroleptics for blocking serotonin 2A receptors rather than the dopamine receptors. Therefore, that risk of the extra pyramidal or Parkinsonian symptoms are going to be lower in this class of therapies. Other drugs you might consider which can cause Parkinsonism include the calcium channel blockers like flunarazine and verapamil, antiemetics like metoclopramide and prochlorperazine, and the dopamine depleters like tetrabinazine, which can be used in managing choreiform symptoms of Huntington's disease. Kind of an interesting tangent I want to take here is to briefly discuss the underlying pathophys. So, chronic exposure to D2 antagonists will actually reduce the expression of D2 receptors in the striatum. Patients who are exposed to D2 antagonists for a long time, they'll produce plenty of dopamine, but that dopamine has got nowhere to go. There's also some interesting rewiring of the basal ganglia circuitry that takes place with chronic D2 receptor antagonism. And to kind of like very crudely summarize these changes, the inhibitory pathway is strengthened permitting the thalamus to send a stronger activating signal to the motor cortex. Together, these microstructural changes produce other strange clinical consequences, like significant dyskinesias when the offending medication is actually withdrawn, so stopping medications can actually make new symptoms worsen. And after stopping months of haloperidol in a patient with severe bradykinesia, you might actually unmask an entirely new set of symptoms for that patient, where they now have developed an uncontrollable oral lingual movement, or they might have flailing dyskinesias of their extremities. Some of the other toxic exposures um, are more associated with risk of idiopathic PD than with a degenerative syndrome. So manganism, for instance, um, is associated with welding. So important to get a kind of occupational history. And people develop uh, manganese deposits in the basal ganglia um, and a Parkinsonian picture um, with a very classic uh, cock walk gait, it's called, where they hyper dorsiflex their foot as they walk. Uh, it's not often seen anymore, but I think I've had a number of patients who were welders in the 1940s and 50s um, mm. who developed um, manganism from that. But even when you suspect a medication is responsible for your patient's bradykinesia or rigidity, what clinical features raise your suspicion that the medication is truly responsible? <laughs> 
I mean, your patient could just as well have idiopathic PD, which is slightly more common than the drug-induced version. In general, we think of drug-induced Parkinson disease when a patient has had a clear history of exposure to medications known to cause PD, and that's obviously the first thing. The second thing would be the type of symptoms the patient's experiencing. A rule of thumb here is that symptoms of drug-induced PD are often symmetric, but up to a third of patients may have asymmetric symptoms, just like in your cases of idiopathic PD. Patients with drug-induced PD usually have more prominent symptoms of bradykinesia and rigidity than their idiopathic counterparts as well. And unlike idiopathic PD, those with drug-related PD are more often female and they're older, because the substantia nigra and most other parts of the brain kind of slowly break down with time. So these demographic features may increase your suspicion as well. A third thing that can help clue you in is the temporal exposure of the patient to that medication and their onset of symptoms. You shouldn't be thinking about drug-induced PD if your bradykinetic patient took whopping doses of metoclopramide during pregnancy five years ago and they haven't touched it since. The patient should notice onset of symptoms of PD while taking the medication, and these symptoms should persist or maybe even worsen while the medication is continued. But if the medication is discontinued, then most of the time the symptoms should stop progressing. Now here's where it can get confusing. And I've been stumped on this in one case when I saw a patient with drug-induced PD. Even after you've stopped taking a drug that can cause Parkinsonism, that doesn't mean you're entirely in the clear. The patient may have persistent rigidity or bradykinesia or tremor or whatever their symptoms were. These may take a long, long time to go away. Or they may not go away at all. Infrequently, and infrequently meaning about 10 to 20% of the time, the symptoms may actually get worse in the months or years after discontinuing the offending medication. The thought here is that the medication may have actually unmasked the patient's idiopathic PD. Or it could be that the chronic exposure to D2 antagonists have irreparably depleted the D2 receptors in the basal ganglia, leaving the patient with permanent Parkinsonian features. And here's where additional diagnostic testing may be useful. Most of this means imaging. Using a sophisticated dopamine transporter scan, or DAT scan, or a DAT SPECT scan to be specific, the presynaptic dopamine secreting neurons will be diminished in idiopathic PD, but they should be normal in drug induced PD. We've posted a great image of this on our blog. And worth noting here is that this scan is extremely useful in patients who have had a prior exposure to a medication known to cause Parkinsonism, but you suspect that this exposure may have only unmasked a latent or mild PD. So you'll see the loss of dopaminergic neurons in the deep gray nuclei whenever the patient has an idiopathic degeneration of the substantia nigra. The other um, kind of toxic exposures we often think about, organophosphate exposure, um, so pesticides for farmers, increases risk of idiopathic PD for unclear reasons. And then there are also some protective factors that we always ask about. Um, coffee decreases your risk of PD, and cigarette smoking also decreases your risk of PD. Not that I would recommend that as a protective uh, measure by any means. And before we conclude this episode, just a quick word on the treatment, which should always focus on the underlying cause. But just to be clear, as we've put in our disclaimers all over the place, Brainwaves is meant to be an educational podcast. It's for fun. We're not giving out any medical advice. We're just summarizing the scientific literature in a way that only sounds like we're giving medical advice. Okay, moving on. When it comes to treatment, sometimes it can be really hard not to treat a patient with a class of medications that's associated with Parkinsonism. We see this all the time in patients who rely on antipsychotics or mood stabilizers. So if you have to use a neuroleptic, often the neurologist will recommend something like clozapine or quetiapine, because these medications carry the lowest risk of extrapyramidal side effects. If your patient's on valproic acid for seizure control, which can also cause Parkinsonism in a small proportion of patients, then maybe consider switching that patient to another broad-spectrum AED, like levetiracetam or lecosamide. And for patients who cannot stop taking the med they're on, because the risks of discontinuation outweigh the benefits, 
Sometimes we've used drugs like trihexyphenidyl or amantadine to manage their symptoms of stiffness and dyskinesias. And in patients who've been off their medications for a long time but still have Parkinsonian features, that's when you might consider a trial of a dopamine agonist or levodopa carbidopa. But for the most part, avoiding the known potential culprits is going to be the best way you manage your patients. As they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that wraps it up for this episode, but stay tuned for more information from Dr. Mantry in her upcoming episode of the Teaching Through Clinical Cases series on brainwaves. I'm Jim Siegler. See you next time. As always, you can get more information about our show from the blog at brainwaves.me or follow us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash brainwaves audio. If you haven't already, please take a moment to rate our show on iTunes. It really does help the word get out. This episode today was produced by me, Jim Siegler, with the help of Erica Mejia, music by Heisen and Jazar. We are supported in part by Audible, your source for audiobooks. Go to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves to get your free 30-day trial and free audiobook of your choosing. Did I mention that it's free? And just by signing up, you support the production of this amazing podcast. So thanks for considering it. I'm Jim Siegler. Thank you for tuning in.